Okay, no one came late. Okay, let's begin our class uh, with a prayer. We pray in a special way through the intercession of our religious founders, all of our congregations are, are founded by men and women who are very much devoted to the Lord Jesus and devoted to the service of people. We also have uh, many diocesan uh, priests and bishops who are saints. We ask for their intercession as well. So we ask them to pray for us together as we pray also to our Blessed Mother. Together we pray the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So Amen. you see our picture here. Of course, we have uh, Sister um, Sister Alice Elioran, who is this lady here. Sister Alice, of course, you know her. Mother Ignacia, Father. Oh, oh, very surely. Mother Ignacia del Espíritu Santo. Well, uh, these are not saints, no? <laughs> but uh, they are, I think these are the first uh, Filipino Society of the Divine Word, the first Filipino SBD priests in the Philippines. No? And here we have a picture of a, of a Spanish priest. He is a Recoleto, the order of Augustinian Recollects. Uh, they were very much present here in the Philippines during the Spanish period and until now. So the Recoleto Fathers run in Manila, a university. Is it already a university or still a college? San Beda? Oh, no, no, San Sebastian, rather. sorry. San Sebastian College, do you know the, uh, that school? It's out there in, um, uh, in Manila. Uh, of course, uh, they also run a school in, uh, in Cebu City. Do you know the name of the school of the Recoleta Fathers in Cebu? University of San Jose, San Jose Recoletos. Recoletos, of course. And they also have a university in Negros Island. You know our University of uh, Negros, Occidental uh, Recoletos. And the SB, of course, the, 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 the Divine Word Fathers, they have educational institutions uh, in the Philippines also. And then the RBM Sisters, they have... Uh, quite a, a vast network of educational institutions in the Philippines. And they run a university in Davao, Davao City. Uh, it's called um, the University of the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll begin discussion on uh, religious institutes, uh, the canonical perspectives of uh, religious institutes. Uh, by the way, uh, I just got a picture from the internet. Uh, this is a congregation of women doing their, uh, I'm not sure if it's their per perpetual vows. Probably it is their perpetual vows. Okay, I placed uh, the picture right above Mother Ignacia because these are RVM, RVM sisters. Okay, this out outline of our discussion. We'll first of all, just a quick nature of religious institutes. We already discussed in the previous class the nature of a consecrated life in general. So it will not be too different. Uh, you know, uh, consecrated life in general and religious institutes. Um, there is a general term for consecrated life, as I mentioned, because there are different forms of consecrated life. One way is religious institute. And um, as we will see uh, in our class, we also have what we call uh, of course, we have, I have explained to you what secular institutes are. Uh, just uh, last, uh, was it last week? Last week, uh, it was a Friday uh, when uh, uh, there came, uh, they visited LSD, a group of uh, Japanese uh, master students from our Jesuit University in uh, Tokyo, Sophia 
University. And uh, they were brought here to the Philippines for their kind of uh, uh, kind of exposure, uh, greater uh, familiarity with Catholic universities. So uh, the leader was a, a, um, a professor, a, a woman, a lady, a Japanese professor in uh, Sophia University. She belongs to a secular institute. So uh, the, the Notre Dame de Ville. So uh, there, as uh, her own consecration is in the world, in the secular world. In fact, in a in a non-Christian environment, though we have a Jesuit university in a, in Tokyo. Uh, of course, it's a Catholic university, but most of the students are not Christians at all. So there you are. That's her own way of consecration as uh, a consecrated woman in the secular setting, no, uh, in the university setting. There, the Notre Dame de Vie. So that's another way of consecration. There's another way of consecration called the societies of apostolic life. Uh, they kind of are similar to religious institutes, but they are different. The difference and the similarities, uh, we will see when we discuss that section on um, societies of apostolic life. So we start with the nature of religious institutes. We will discuss the establishment and the suppression as well of religious houses. Uh, we will see how religious institutes are governed. Uh, there has to be a system of governance in our religious institutes. Otherwise, we will all disintegrate. We will all separate from one another and we will not be able to fulfill our mission effectively without a very clear sense of governance. Uh, of course, uh, since we are, we are human beings, we are not angels, unless some of you are angels, we have to discuss the administration of temporal goods. Okay? We will also discuss, oh, it's oh, very important, because many of you are formators. No? Formation in our religious institutes according to the code of canon law. Okay, there is a term here called incorporation. Incorporation is a term which refers to the full membership, full membership of a man or a woman in the religious institute. So therefore, incorporation is preceded by what? Formation. Okay? A one has to be formed first according to the spirit and nature of our religious institute, and then that man or woman is incorporated in the religious institute. Okay, we will also discuss, okay, sorry. We will also discuss the obligations and the rights of the institutes and their members. Here, this is a very critical topic because sometimes, not because of malice, not because they are bad people, <laughs> some, re some religious superiors um, commit injustice no? in relation to the members. Some members are dismissed, no? dismissed without due process. Oh, no, that cannot be done. Why? Because members have rights also. No? And sometimes if they're in the rights of members are not respected by the religious institute, they can file a case in the Vatican against our own religious congregation. So we have to know uh, the obligations and rights of institutes. Then, of course, apostolate of the institutes and separation also. If we have formation, admission, and incorporation, there are also situations when members of religious institutes have to be separated from our congregation. Okay, so let's start with the nature of religious institutes. It's, this is in Canon 607, paragraph one. Okay, uh, let me read uh, the text. Uh, if you have your copy, soft copy or hard copy, don't forget our Bible. 
in a sense, no, it's the code of canon law is a kind of a Bible. Okay. So I will read it aloud. In the future, I'll also ask you to read the canon. Huh? Okay. So get your, your code of canon law ready. So 607, paragraph 1. As a consecration of the whole person, religious life manifests in the church a wonderful marriage brought about by God, a sign of the future age. In the olden times, uh, the professional vows looked like a marriage. No, they wear the wedding gown for, the, for those, the novice, to profess the vows. So there in the olden times, you see clearly the marriage no? uh, between the person uh, uh, who consecrates herself to the Lord Jesus. I wonder, do you still do that? Do some congregations still uh, dress like a bride? Yes, in the divine zeal? We have zeal alone. Okay, so you wear kind of a, a bride, bride's dress. Okay, for perpetual profession. See, 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 see. Flowers, yeah, flowers here on the head. Okay. Um, okay, let's continue reading the canon. Thus, the religious brings to perfection a total self-giving as a sacrifice offered to God, through which his or her whole existence becomes a continuous worship of God in charity. Okay, that's the basic nature of consecrated life. Okay, I will proceed to the second paragraph of Canon 607. A religious institute is a society in which members, according to proper law, pronounce public vows. Yeah, that's the first thing, in, in the first juridical matter that really distinguishes religious congregations, no, members. Public vows. So what does, what does public mean? No? Um, how many people are required? <laughs> For a for a vow a ceremony to be public, in fact, it does not um, it does not matter how many, if as long as there are witnesses, no? uh, it is a public matter when there are witnesses to the profession of vows. No, it's not the number of people. You know, it's similar to marriage. Uh, one requirement for a marriage. Uh, apart from the, the minister who is officiating at the marriage, we only need two people apart from the man and the woman to get married. We only need two witnesses. That's all. Okay? Uh, because if there is a, if there is a lack of a witness, then it becomes an invalid marriage. So in the same way, in our case as religious, there has to be witnesses even just two, then it becomes a public vow. Either perpetual or temporary. Okay, the basic uh, route will be the novices first profess temporary vows. Eventually, then they profess the perpetual vows. Now the temporary vows, they're always, they're always renewed. No? Uh, uh, the, now, there are differences in our own religious congregations in terms of the number of years of a temporary vow and the number of uh, renewals. But canon law will set the maximum number of years when a person is in temporary vows. We will see that. However, when the period of time has elapsed and lead a life of brothers or sisters uh, in common, Okay, temp perpetual or temporary vows, which are to be renewed, however, when the period of time has elapsed, no? when the kind of the validity of a temporary vow is uh, it has relapsed, then it can be renewed or not renewed. Okay, 
And the third paragraph is this one. The public witness to be rendered by religious to Christ and the church entails a separation from the world proper to the character and purpose of each institute. Now, the term separation from the world um, is, is a requirement for all of us uh, members of religious, no? Uh, the fact that we are we bind ourselves together in a religious congregation, uh, there is already a kind of separation from the world that is required. Now, don't get me wrong. There are different ways to define separation from the world. No, this does not mean that we will not encounter people anymore. No, uh, in fact, in many cases, like I know some religious uh, congregations especially of sisters, I know the Good Shepherd sisters, they have communities that are right there in the midst of, 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 of the barangay. They have what they call insertion communities. They Are they separated from the world when they're in the midst of the world? They are in the midst of the world, but they live a common life as an institute. That makes kind of a the separation uh, effective, no? which means that basically we have our own character. We have our own profession. That makes us, uh, in a sense, the same, but different from, uh, from other people. There. So let's uh, talk about now religious houses. Now there are, I know while you're listening, there are things that come to your mind. How many years of a perpetual, a temporary profession? Uh, we will see that when we discuss uh, more deeply. You know? So we have this topic on religious houses. So you might re uh, recognize what, well, this is actually not a religious house, but it is one of the administration buildings of which university? USC, no? the University of Santo Tomas. Okay. In fact, uh, somewhere here, uh, you have there the ecclesiastical faculties. Huh? And I think uh, in the on the in the one week of the ecclesiastical faculty building is the community of the Dominican fathers. I was able to have a, a lunch there uh, one time with the fathers of the University of Santo Tomas. Okay, by the way, uh, by the way, the, this structure of the University of Santo Tomas, if you look at it, it just looks like any other university in Europe. No, uh, for those who have been in Europe, you will see that uh, the USD campus is really a gem within the, the city of Manila. So there it's, it's patterned. In fact, the University of Santo Tomas is the oldest university uh, in Asia in the European context and the European uh, notion of a university. Yeah, it is. Okay, and uh, this one, I don't know if you recognize this. Uh, this is the facade of their chapel, anyone? It's very close to Ateneo. It's a monastery. The poor Clares. There's a picture of the poor Clares, the, the Santa Clara, we call. Just there near the flyover before you get to Ateneo. And, of course, uh, you know this place. Where Where is this place? In Loyola School. <laughs> of theology. If you don't recognize it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for you if you don't recognize it. Okay, so these are houses. Uh, in fact, that is not the house. That's part of the chapel. The community of Jesuits is on this side. Cannot see it anymore. And another way, on this side. Uh, okay, that's where the communities are located. Okay. Oh, so we have here a sister opening the door of their community. Could you guess what congregation this sister belongs to? Anyone? What congregation? Daughters of Charity. Father. Very good. Yes, yeah, the Daughters of Charity. The Daughters of Charity is a society of apostolic life. It is not a religious institute, as we will see in a while. No, not in a while, but sometime in the future. Okay, this is... I'm just, I, just, I just want to, to show you some pictures. So this is the whole complex of Loyola House of Studies and Loyola School of Theology in 1965. That is where we are now. Surely you cannot recognize it because 
This area now is full of houses. <laughs> that down there, the Barranca area, Marikina, that's now full of houses. So where are we? We are somewhere here where there is no building yet. The building where we are now, of course, for us who are on site, it, it was constructed somewhere here. So this is the original structure of the Loyola House of Studies and Loyola School of Theology. Okay? Okay, establishment of a house, Canon 609. Oh, yes, uh, Father Albertus. I have a question about Canon 607. Yes. Second paragraph. Uh -huh. a religious Institute is a society. What's the meaning uh, about the a society? Uh, is it uh, some kind of a group or community or maybe a specific term about uh, Canon? Yes. So in Canon uh, 607, paragraph 2, it states a religious institute is a society. Okay, it is a society in the sense that it is an organized group. Okay, as an organized group, it has uh, a system of governance, meaning there are leaders uh, in charge and there are members. So, and in a society, there are rules and regulations that bind everyone. So if you reflect on our own religious institutes, uh, it precisely fits that, that kind of a description. So in that sense, it is a society. Yes. So, um, yeah, could you, like in the, in the diocesan context, uh, could we say that uh, a diocese is a society? Well, to a certain extent, but uh, there's a kind of a loose, there's a looser kind of arrangement uh, because uh, there is no, uh, uh, well, I guess the presbyterium, those incarnated in a diocese, it has, it says it is a society because they are bound together by their vow of obedience to the bishop. There are rules and regulations uh, with the, among the presbyterium. Uh, so that's it. So that's what society means there. Thank you. Okay, now to establish a house, there has to be a prior written consent of the diocesan bishop. We cannot just enter a place. We cannot enter a place and construct a house and live there and tell the bishop, hello, bishop, we are here. It cannot be like that, no? Um, Many of us would want to do that. So may, we might want to say, why do we have to ask permission? It, we are a religious congregation. But unfortunately, uh, really, uh, I don't know if it, uh, I don't want to mean that it's unfortunate. But the fact is, uh, the Deos and Bishop is in charge uh, of the people who are living and are present in his diocese. So we need to have that prior written consent. No? Okay, so I'm sure normally this is not a problem, but uh, uh, in some dioceses, bishops actively invite religious congregations to come to the diocese. No? Uh, however, in some cases, uh, the religious congregation has to initiate, initiate a process wherein the congregation will be allowed to establish a house within the territory of the diocese. Okay. Now, a religious house okay, is established by a formal decree by the authority competent according to the constitutions. Okay? For us, religious congregations, in fact, it is not the bishop who, by formal decree, creates a house. Now, when we talk of a house, yeah, sure, it's a house, but we are talking more importantly of a community. No? A community comes together and lives in a specific place. No? So to create a community that lives in a house, it is our, uh, our superior. The superior has to give a formal degree. And the religious superior, uh, you should, uh, no, the superior general, is the, the competent authority to establish a religious house. Okay? After 
the permission of the diocesan bishop has been obtained. So first, exploratory. And then if the bishop agrees, then the house can be established, constructed, and a community uh, organized in the particular diocese. Okay, now in the case, uh, we do not have uh, cloistered nuns here in class, but a monastery of cloistered nuns is established by the Holy See. There might be an initiative, as I think I told you the story about the first Carmelite missionary, uh, the, Car the first Carmelite uh, monastery in Ghana. Uh, the initiative was taken by the Archbishop of a diocese, and he felt yeah, it's good for us to have a monastery in a diocese. And so with that initiative, then he asked permission from the Vatican no, to be able to allow a cloistered community of nuns be established in the diocese. So in that case, the community of the Carmelite uh, nuns from the Philippines that established the first monastery of Carmelites in Ghana. Now, uh, the bishop's consent uh, is governed by Canon 611, the consent of the diocesan bishop for the establishment of a religious house carries with it, within it the right of the religious, okay? So first, of course, there's, it starts with getting to know you, what's your congregation, what is your history, uh, what is your apostolate in the world, after all that, and then the permission is granted. When the bishop gives the permission, now the bishop has to recognize the right of the religious to lead a life according to the character and purpose of proper to the institute. Okay? So therefore, uh, the bishop has to know the charism of a religious congregation. When the diocesan bishop approves the opening of a house, then he has to respect that character. He has to respect that charism. So therefore, for example, if a community of the Camellian sisters, the ministers of the infirm, those who have ministry among the sick people, a group of nuns, were allowed to, to establish a house in the diocese, no, the bishop cannot tell the superior, ah, mother, could you uh, open a school in my diocese? That's not proper because that is not the specific charism of this religious congregation. There has to be a good deal of respect for our charism. Now, um, the religious congregation also receives the permission to engage in the works that are proper to the institute, as I mentioned. And then there might be any conditions you know, attached. So, uh, uh, there has to be a contract, definitely, between uh, uh, the superior general as represented by the provincial and the bishop. And if there are any conditions that are attached to the agreement, then it has to be specified you know, what conditions are attached uh, to the consent. Okay? Um, Example, examples of certain conditions, finances. There has to be a financial agreement no? uh, between, uh, because there are many problems that arise uh, due to lack of clarity. Uh, for example, if you, uh, you're a congregation of sisters, you're, you're, you're allowed no, to establish a school. Uh, I think in that situation, it's very clear that the property belongs to the religious congregation especially if they also bought the land. But in many cases, the bishop tells you, oh, bishop, uh, sister, mother, provincial, this land belongs to the diocese. Okay, you can build your school there. That is a very happy, the, the, the provincial. But without very clear agreement, then problems will arise no? uh, regarding that setup because the land belongs to the, to the diocese itself. Uh, there have been cases, uh, oh, so many. Um, well, uh, you might know the situation of the Jesuits before. Uh, we were present in San Pablo City in Laguna. We had an Ateneo there, Ateneo de San Pablo. Uh, we were invited by a previous uh, bishop to establish a school. In, after the war, uh, 
after 1945. So we established a school, it was an elementary school. Uh, and then uh, it, it thrived and many of our, the locals there were formed. Some of the local businessmen are graduates of the school. And then the new bishop comes in and uh, says, uh, no, I want, I want the area, I want the land, and I want the school back to the diocese. Well, it was very clear to us that we did not own the school. No? Uh, so when, uh, and then the people started to get angry at the bishop because, you know, <laughs> uh, you know because the bishop wanted to run the, the school system in Laguna. Liceo, the Liceo system. Well, uh, in the end, okay, surely uh, we'd love to stay, but we had to go. We had to leave because uh, uh, this is not uh, our own school. But anyway, after so many troubles, in there were even demonstrations. Imagine <laughs> demonstrations in the city of San Pablo. No, don't, don't go. Uh, we want the Jesuits here. <laughs> so we don't want any more troubles. So we just left, no? Okay, Sister Alice, you're raising your hand. I thought, oh, maraming school to. Yeah, yeah, Father. I wanted to ask with regard to that um, land, Father, that has been um, um, that not given, but uh, was what you said, said, Father. In the title of the land, what is written there, Father, even in the contract, is a per perpetual use. As long as the, the as long as the congregation will follow the the agreement, say for example, yeah. you will use as a perpetual as long as it will exist as an educational institution. But then, Father, there is one of uh, many cases, not only once, that they just um, divulge that perpetual profession and they just have immediately uh, got it. Uh, my question, Father, is that uh, is perpetual profession really a perpetual until the, the until it is been used for the ministry or the 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 diocese or the bishop can just immediately take it as long as they wanted to use the, the land. Oh, well, you know, this is the importance of, of uh, having agreements that are valid in civil law. Okay, If there is a contract uh, between the bishop and the congregation, it should not just be a church contract. It has to be valid in the government. No? So if, because if, uh, like, yeah, if if it if the document says it is a per, it's a perpetual contract as long as the original intention for allowing a religious congregation to use the land is maintained, then uh, we have all, the congregation has uh, all the rights no to to the utilization of the land as long as it's very clear that it's perpetual use of the land by this religious congregation. Um, well, as you all know, contracts do expire. Okay, uh, while they are valid, it cannot be changed unless both parties agree, diba? to change the contract. Uh, I I tell you a kind of a story, you know, uh, regarding us. We have a retreat house in Angono. It's called the Loyola Retreat House. For it was what happened was the it, the land was donated. No, to the Society of Jesus with a specific purpose that it should be used as a retreat house. Okay, so and then after, after it was 1964, the land was uh, donated. So the retreat house was built. Now, uh, th then there was a good deal of time until about five or ten, five years ago. Uh, there was, uh, no, it was uh, around 10 years ago. There was, because it was, it was not maintained anymore. It was kind of dilapidated. So there were talks within the Society of Jesus. Why don't we just sell the property? Okay, many did not know the background. They did not know that there was a contract. Uh, and then um, one of our fathers who wanted to rehabilitate the retreat center, retreat house, dug into the documents. And it clearly says that it's use of property. As long as it, the place is used as a retreat house, if it cannot be sold, therefore, no? Uh, if the purpose is changed, it became a school, then the owners have the right to take the land back. So uh, that's my reply, uh, Sister, Sister Alice. I know uh, the situation in Nagkarlang Laguna, my hometown, the hometown of my father, uh, the initial contract of 50 years of administering the St. Mary's Academy in Nagkarlang expired 
uh, some years ago, that was around 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 10 years ago. I, I remember Sister Nisa was the directress. Uh, at the time, there were negotiations with the diocese. And uh, very happily, uh, the contract was renewed for another 50 years. So are you, are you aware of that, Sister Alice? Okay. Uh, Sister, uh, you have a question. Yes. Yes, I think it is correct that uh, we are also protected by, by civil law. Yeah, it is, and it's totally just. It is, it is correct you know, that uh, our contracts, it is also, it is also uh, mentioned in canon law that uh, we should try to make sure that all our contracts in canon law has a certain validity also in civil law. The civil law of the land, no? where we find ourselves. Other questions you might have? Okay, uh, let's continue, no? So, uh, the bishop, when the, he gives permission to a religious congregation to be present in the diocese, when the permission is given for clerical religious institutes, so these are religious congregations with priests, clerical, no? And it also gives the permission to have a church and to conduct the sacred, mystery, uh, sacred ministries if that is a religious congregation for men, no? Uh, now, for religious congregations for women, the permission also includes to have a chapel and that, to have an oratory within, you know, of course, it's obvious that we have to fulfill, you know, uh, our identity and our character as religious. So we have to have the, these facilities also. Okay, now, of course, every house should have a house superior, huh? or whatever term you might want to use, no? A coordinator or a servant leader or uh, whatever. As in basta the, the one who is in charge, no? Now is it possible that we are all in charge? It's not possible, no. Uh, okay, we are all equal, we are all sisters together, we are all brothers. Uh, but it cannot be that according to the canon law, one has to be in charge. No? <laughs> Otherwise, we will, uh, we will float into the moon. No? <laughs> okay. So a religious community is to live in a locally constituted house. Does it have to be owned by the congregation? Not necessarily, as long as it is a house. It can be rented. <laughs> no, it can be constructed. Or whatever, no, it can be a tree house if you want, as long as it's it's a place to stay, no. Okay, it should be under the authority of a superior according to the norms of canon law. So it's very clear, no. So let's look at canon six hundred eight. A religious community must live in a legitimately established house under the authority of a superior designated according to the norm of law. Each house is to have at least an oratory in which the Eucharist is to be celebrated and reserved so that it is truly the center of the community. Okay. Uh, this is something quite important according to 629 regarding superiors. Superiors are to reside each in his or her own house. Okay? And they are not to leave it except in accordance with the Institute's own law. Okay? Uh, we have to avoid, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm laughing because uh, I'm sure in each congregation there is a superior who is always out of the house. Do you have superiors who are always absent from the house? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it is, it is a reminder. Huh? Okay, fine. That superior lives in the house. She has a room. Okay? But look at this. They are not to leave it except accordance with the institute's own law. Now, a, a religious congregation might designate 
that a religious superior should not be out of the house for more than one week. It depends on our own religious, uh, our constitutions. Huh? So uh, that's it. No? Uh, according to the institute's own law. Are, you, are there some questions about the residence of a superior in your house? Or maybe some communities would rather not have the superior present always in the house. <laughs> yes, we should respect huh, our superiors. No questions? Okay, no, okay. Your superiors are okay. Okay, you don't have to share your personal experience. Okay, now this is important. Canon 612, change in purpose of a house. What does it say? The diocesan bishop, his consent is required. If a religious house will be used for apostolic works other than those for which it was established. I tell you as an example, no? I will not say what congregation. No? <laughs> this is a congregation for men. Again, sometimes you know, this the length of time. Sometimes we lose track. We lose track of history. There was this uh, congregation that established. Uh, they established a seminary in a diocese here in the Philippines. It was a seminary, a minor seminary. So this must have been in the nineteen sixties. No. So this and the bishop allowed this religious congregation to open this this seminary in his diocese, and you know how much how much was charged uh, uh, for the use uh, of the land of the diocese one peso every year. So it was a kind of a symbolic symbolic gesture, and it was a, you know out of the generosity of the bishop. From the 1960s, 70s, 1980s, 1990s, what happened to the minor seminary? There came very, very few. The, the seminarians got very, very few. So what did the congregation do? Okay, uh, we have these facilities here. Um, instead of a minor seminary, let's just start, let's change it into a school. So the congregation turned it into a school, no? So it became very uh, rather prosperous. It was a good, high quality school, huh? And so uh, they had many students, and many of their students became prominent, no? Prominent in the city, etc. Now what happened now? Nine, year two thousand, around early two thousand. Then there was a new bishop. Okay, and the new bishop. Uh, uh, wanted, uh, I think he just wanted to take over the, the, the land, no? And they found out in the original document that this was supposed to be a seminary. But now it has become a school. So now, uh, like uh, there were, the contract was not, uh, was not honored, no? So therefore, there were problems and the issue reached Rome for litigation because uh, the, the congregation and the bishop, they were you know, uh, trying to, you know, oppose each other until the case was brought to go. Okay, I just assure you that uh, that congregation is not in this class, no? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think that the Vatican ruled in favor of the bishop, of the diocese, but I guess understandably so. Okay. No, uh, the consent is not required, no, uh, uh, of the diocesan bishop for a change concerning only internal governance and discipline. Uh, new members in the community, the, the bishop does not have to give, be given the permission. It's that's uh, the that's the role of the provincial, the new superior or a uh, new discipline that is uh, you know uh, put in place uh, in the congregation in the house. No need for the bishop to get involved. What is important is the apostolic work originally uh, for which the permission has, was given should be maintained. Yes, uh, Father. Uh, is there any uh, improvement in the uh, regulation or rules in the congregation? Uh, because it's always uh, have a connection with the canon. 
Yes. And the law is always uh, your improvement. Is there any connection there? Uh, uh, connection between? Uh, I think, I, I mean, every congregation is have uh, own regulation. Yes. And it is uh, what always get to, if in the canon law, there, there are a new, what, uh, new law or something. In the, uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, there's a question here. You know, uh, okay, what we have basically is the 1983 Code of Canon Law. So this is the law in vigor, the law that we have to apply. So uh, if this is the law that we have to apply, then religious congregations should adapt their constitutions and their complementary norms according to the new Code of Canon Law. So that's important, like uh, for example, because they have to be uh, consistent with one another. Of course, there are specific uh, laws that govern religious institutes. Uh, but when the 1983 Code of Canon Law was enacted, all religious congregations had to adjust their, their law. So there, there is a, a kind of a... a mandatory. Right? Yeah, that is mandatory. If there are... Conflicts, then the canon law has to prevail. Yes. Yes, uh, sister? Yes. 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 Uh, in the rules and regulations of religious congregations. So in fact, uh, the Jesuits, after 1983, there was a general congregation, we call it, that's a general chapter, that was called just to update our laws, the Society of Jesus' Laws, uh, according to the Code of Canon Law. So it's quite a tedious process. <laughs> yeah, I hope uh, our congregations also, also uh, did that. Now, uh, this is an important topic, no? because uh, uh, there, there's a good deal of uh, interaction that happens between religious congregations and the diocesan bishop. No? In our case here in the Ateneo, we are under the Diocese of Cubao, under uh, uh, Bishop Onesto Ong Choco. So we ask ourselves, what is the authority of the bishop uh, regarding our religious congregations involved in diocesan works? All of us are in the diocese. No, you can we cannot be hanging up there. No, we are all in the diocese. So according to Canon 681, paragraph one, the works which the diocesan bishop entrusts to religious are under the authority and direction of the bishop. Okay, so um, it's very clear in the case of parishes that are in the diocese, which are run by religious congregations. No? There, in that example, there is a very clear sense of authority and direction uh, of the bishop over the parish. Okay. Now, it says here, uh, quite important also, without prejudice to the rights of religious superiors in accordance with Canon 678, Paragraph 2. Let's check what is 678, paragraph 2. Religious are also subject to their own superiors. Okay? Uh, in particular, those working in diocesan apostolates, no? diocesan ministries. In the exercise of a, an apostolate, towards persons outside of the institute. 
There are certain apostolate which are internal to our congregation. Now, for us, for example, the Jesuits, no? Uh, Loyola School of Theology, Ateneo de Manila University, it's internal. It is, it is uh, a ministry of the Society of Jesus, as well as in your own religious congregations. No? However, some of our members are assigned in institutions outside the congregation. The parish of the Diocese of Cubao, or, uh, or a religious sister working in uh, the Diocesan Curia. Or uh, yeah, a religious uh, uh, sister uh, working as a secretary, for example, of the bishop. In that case, so surely the religious is under the direction of the bishop, but he he or she is also subject to the religious superior, obviously, you know, because uh, we are uh, we are vowed men and women. And we, uh, if we are religious aside in the Yosasan ministries, we have to remain faithful to the discipline of the institute. So for example, regarding the vow of poverty, no? if I were uh, a religious priest uh, working, for example, in the, the, in the radio station of the diocese, and uh, I was allowed by my bishop to work there in cooperation with the diocese. So I have to, and then I have many gifts because I have many guests in the radio, radio program. Uh, the, the, you know, mga artista, you know, all kinds of celebrities. And they give me gifts, oh, gifts, a lot of money. Oh, Father, you use this, this is for you. We have to remain faithful to the discipline of the institute. We have to remain faithful to our vow of poverty. You cannot say, hey, anyway, I already work in the diocese. My other companions, this diocesan priest, they have their own, <laughs> they have a lot of money. <laughs> Is that true, Father <laughs> Albert? <laughs> you know, they have no vow of poverty, so they have their bank accounts, no? Oh, well, anyway, I work in the diocese. No. Faithful to the discipline of the institute. Remember that. Any questions so far? Father Pero. Yes, yeah, sister. They don't have uh, uh, the file of how they have also to how something. Did they have anything that uh, at least uh, restrain them when it comes to. Uh, okay. So the question here is this. No? Well, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the priests, uh priests, uh, they do not have a vow of poverty. That's for sure. Okay, and uh, we should not use the lens of religious institutes no? to to evaluate another person. No, because a religious a religious institute with our vow of poverty is different from the life of a diocesan priest. Okay, because even remember, the situation is also different. For us, religious, if we get sick, for example, if we get hospitalized, who pays for our, <laughs> for our hospitalization? It's the religious congregation. But in some cases, among the U.S. and clergy, if they get sick and get hospitalized, there is no congregation to, to pay for their hospitalization. And, you know, really, the bishop has to, to support no, them. But in many cases, especially, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in poorer dioceses, uh, there's no way for them to support themselves uh, uh, in the, for their hospitalization. Just uh, last month of February, my uncle, who is a secular priest no, of the Archdiocese of Manila, he's 93 years old, he was hospitalized. And for them, the, arch, the, the, the priest of the Archdiocese of Manila, they go to Cardinal Santos Hospital there in Green Hills. And uh, everything is paid for by, by the ARCAM, no? Our, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Manila. But that's ARCAM. But there are many other dioceses who do not have that, you know, that support. So therefore, uh, you know, because of the difference of life, so they don't have vow of poverty, but uh, in general, in, in the code of canon law, there is always a, a, a kind of a, an exhortation to live a simple life. No? Uh, in a way that our life 
uh, as priests and religious uh, will not uh, deter uh, lay people from coming to us. So that's a big, there's still uh, some guidelines no, for that. Other questions you might have? Yes, Sister Jennifer. Just a comment, Father. Yes. Uh, regarding, like, for example, if we will be assigned to one parish, but we are also under the diocesan um, diocese. Diocese, yes. But then uh, we see to it that we are supposed to have a contract before going to uh, work with them or work with the bishop or with the diocese. Because I know that if it is, because the lifestyle is different from us. So it's really very, it's supposed to be very clear to our guidelines that this, that we sisters are supposed to have like oratory, like a chapel, and then we have this plan. Something like that, Father. Because if yeah. not, if there's no guidelines, it's really very difficult for us to work in that diocese. That's true, sister. Yeah, the, the there has to be a memorandum of agreement that uh, clearly indicates the expectations and the obligations of both parties, no? The obligation of the religious congregation and the duties and obligations of the, the diocese itself. Okay? And of course, as a contract, there has to be a limit. Uh, limit so that when things have to be changed, then it can easily be changed also. Yeah, just to avoid the you know, problems also. Okay, so let's continue. You know? Now, a religious house can be suppressed also lawfully. You no, know? lawfully closing a house, a religious house. So, the supreme moderator, when we talk about supreme moderator, this is a, the superior general of the religious. Congregation. The, so the general can, after consultation with the diocesan bishop and in accordance with the constitution, suppress a lawfully established religious house. Now, why, for example, why, why does the superior general have to suppress a community, a house? For example, when there are no more vocations, no? Uh, there should be three members in a community. What if it has been, it has been ongoing and it will be more or less a permanent situation when there will be no other religious who will stay in the community and there remains only two religious? Then that can be a reason for the suppression of an established religious house. There. And whatever, uh, like uh, I remember I was... Uh, I was sending um, letters of information to different religious congregations of, uh, just to inform them about LST. So there was this religious superior who called me, who wrote by email, Father, please don't send us any more any, uh, any communications from LST because our community has been suppressed. Apparently, this is a small congregation of sisters and they have already left the country. Yeah, so because of different reasons, they found it a bit difficult uh, to, to uh, in terms of growth here in the Philippines. So decided, they decided to suppress, I think it was the only religious house that they had in the Philippines. And then uh, by, and it was suppressed by the Supreme Moderator or the General. Sister Alice, please. Yes, you have a uh, question. Father, I just would like to ask with regard to that father suppression. Can... A religious, say for example, Father, only two or three remaining uh, members of the congregation. Can one congregation, Father, merge with other congregation? Would that be uh, possible, Father? Is it uh, lawful in the canon? Yes, sister. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, that is definitely, uh, there's a provision in canon law for uh, aggregation no? of smaller congregations, but uh, with similar with similar spirituality, no? Because uh, if the spirituality are very much uh, different, then there will be issues concerned there, no? But they can merge together. Yes, that is part of the canonical uh, canonical procedures. Yes. Thank you, Father. Okay, Sister Jennifer. That happened to us, the Sri Lankan 
Dominicans, they joined us. So oh, they okay. moved to us, yes. Sri Lankans and Philippines. And the, the Sri Lankan Foundation is a totally different, it is Dominican, but a totally different yes. foundation. Yeah, but they can stay there on their yeah. own. Yeah. In, like a region. And of course, since both are Dominicans, there's a very clear, uh, clear, um, um, Harrison. Yes, yes, that's good. So that's an example of, a, of a aggregation. Okay. Yes, uh, Sister Ella, do you have a question? Please uh, unmute yourself, Sister Ella. Yes, well, good afternoon. Uh, about suppression, po, is there a specific number of years that the congregation can be su suppressed here in the Philippines? Like, for example, if they doesn't have any more um, relig religious sisters who wants to enter like that, and uh, it, it is still the same that they are foreigner. Okay. Uh, you're asking if there is a... Uh, 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 what do you mean? Limit of numbers of members of a congregation? Yes, po and uh, yes, po. Yung parang hindi na po sila nadadagdagan at wala pong nag-enter yes. sa kanilang Filipino sisters. Okay. Po. Yeah. Basically, uh, as uh, to 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 have a house, there has to be three persons. So therefore, in a congregation, uh, there has to be three three members. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to keep a, to keep a community and therefore to be present in a diocese and in a country yeah pag uh, okay. if it's less than 3 then uh, then there arises uh, that uh, the the need really to 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 su officially suppress a community that three persons if it's okay if, if it's foreigner oh yeah it does that matter you mean foreigner you said foreigner Yes, Pa. Yes, uh, any member of the congregation, regardless of nationality. Okay, Pa. Thank you, Pa. Yes. Okay. So there are other cases of uh, suppression no, of a religious congregation, uh, of other uh, forms of consecrated life here, the suppression of a soul house of an institute. So let's see how this, this canon fits into the question no? of, 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 uh, of Sister Ella. The only house of the institute. Okay, we are talking about the institute in the world, huh? not just the uh, a house in a, in, a, in a country. No? The only house, the sole house in the world. No? Only the Holy See can do that. Only the Vatican. Suppress or prescribe concerning the property of the house. What do we do with our, with our building, with our property? Okay, so that's very clear. And the reason is this. That religious congregation was established by the Holy See. Okay? And therefore, it's only the Vatican that can suppress. When the, when the soul house of the institute is suppressed, meaning the religious congregation, in a sense, disappears. No? Okay. And that is a very serious matter. No? That no, not even the superior general of that community uh, can do. Because the Vatican wants to put a reason of the congregation. It was founded and it thrived at a certain point in history. So they have to make sure that this congregation has to be suppressed because they might find some other means, no? like what was mentioned by uh, Sister Jennifer, it can be merged or aggregated to another similar congregation. Now, uh, regarding the suppression of an autonomous house, of canons regular and of monks under a superior general. No, okay. So uh, we are not quite too familiar with canons regular, but it is a it's a kind of a monastic life, no? living together under a superior general. 
uh, the general chapter of that monastery decides no? uh, the suppression of such a monastery. Now, regarding the suppression of an autonomous monastery of cloistered nuns, for example, the poor clares near Ateneo, or the, uh, the, the Carmelite uh, nuns in Ghana, they are, they are an autonomous monastery of cloistered nuns. Again, it is only the Vatican who can suppress any monastery. And the property of the monastery Okay, the Vatican rules what happens to the property as long as uh, the provisions of the constitutions of that cloistered nun community is respected. Okay, so for, uh, for example, here in the Philippines, there are many uh, monasteries of the Carmelites. No? There are many. Quezon City, Lipa, everywhere. If one will be suppressed, the Vatican is competent to do that, not the bishop, no, not even the sisters themselves, no, not even the prior, the prioress can do that. Okay. So uh, let's go to this topic on the governance of religious. Yeah. So we talked about the, the nature of the institute. We talked about uh, religious houses of the institute. We talked about the role of superiors. Uh, here we will, in a deeper way, uh, talk about the role of superiors and the governance of uh, religious congregations. Uh, I just found this picture, no? Uh, they are very happy. So uh, let's see. The superior is regulated in Canon 620. Okay, so the major superior, who is a major superior? A major superior governs an entire institute in the world. So for example, there might be a religious congregation that, you know, that's quite few, no? Uh, uh, he or she can govern the entire institute, in which case uh, he or she will function like a general or a supreme moderator. Or in most cases, a major superior governs a province. Now take note, a province does not necessarily have what to be one country. There are provinces composed of different countries that are near each other, okay? A major superior also governs a part equivalent to a province. What might be uh, a, 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 an arrangement that is equivalent to a province? A region, for example. Other congregations have regions. Uh, what are the other names? Uh, could you help me? Uh, what are the names of your groupings in your congregation, which is not a province? So I mentioned a region, a district. I heard uh, some of you mentioned district. Vicariate. Vicariate. Or Vicariate. Yeah, Vicariate. District. What else? What other terms that you... We use oh, sorry, Father. We use commissariat. Commissariat, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, also a major superior uh, governs an autonomous house of monks whose house superior functions as the, the provincial. Okay, so that is the major superior. You know, in canon law, I just noticed, surely we have major superiors. But in canon law, there is no mention about a minor superior. <laughs> major, so you would expect, oh, there should be a minor superior. No, only major superior. After the major superior, then you have members. So, okay. Okay, what okay, the, the following are also major superiors. Yeah. For example, with the Benedictines and the Cistercians, the abbot, the abbot of a monastery is a major superior, in a sense, a kind of a provincial, no? 
So therefore, for the Benedictines here in Manila, there is a San Beda University. They have a community there. So they have an abbot. And that abbot is the major superior. The, the abbot in Bukidnon in Malay Malay, the Monastery of the Transfiguration, the abbot there is also the major superior of the monastery. Okay, now uh, we have the superior general, Canon 625. The superior general is this designated by canonical election in accordance with the constitutions. And that election is done during the what? General chapter. The general chapter. Okay. And as we all know, the general chapter is preceded by what? Provincial chapter. Correct. The provincial chapters uh, of all the provinces all over the world no? for congregations which are uh, rather big. So that is it. No? The canonic, they are elected. No? You know, for the Society of Jesus, there is only one election that is conducted in the Jesuits. Only the election of the superior general. All other superiors, major superiors or minor superiors, everyone is appointed. So, the, so there you see how dictatorial <laughs> we are. <laughs> You, you, you mean, Father, your provincial superior is uh, yes. so, nominated? Yes, uh, this is our process. It's like a mix, no? Uh, so what we do, uh, for example, recently we have a new provincial, no? The process is those with, uh, those with perpetual vows, we are given a kind of a paper, but it is non-binding. It's non-binding. We just write, who do you think? Uh, would fit to become the provincial. It is not uh, binding. It's just an information uh, that is, uh, there is a committee that is appointed, uh, that, that, that is formed to check that out. And then uh, surely there are candidates that are more, well, not really popular, yeah, but uh, so many uh, wrote his name and they are interviewed. They are interviewed by this body, no? Uh, which includes the provincial, no? So, uh, how are you? How is your health? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, how is your vocation? Uh, what are your dreams for for the for the Jesuits? Yeah, like that, like that. Uh, and then what is done next is three names are sent to Father General, and Father General chooses one of them. So in our case, so three names were sent to Father General. Father General chose Father Savior Olin to become our provincial. But you know what? In other countries, I heard, in fact, I was a bit shocked. No? A province sent, would send three names. Then you know what the general would do? Please send me another three names. So which means he could not choose any one of them. <laughs> So when we heard that, oh my God, what province is that? <laughs> but here in the Philippine province, uh, there's every time, you know, we have been a province since 1950, well, 1956. Each time we send three names, we call it a terna. The general always chooses one. So meaning, okay naman. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so that's the way we, it's kind of a mix. No? Uh, we have the general make a decision, but the, uh, the final decision is uh, uh, given by him. And how about the counselors, Father? Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, our counselors in the Philippines, in the Philippine province, yeah, they're all, uh, they are uh, appointed by the general also with, with uh, advice from the provincial. So the provincial uh, would uh, nominate a name to Father General, and then the uh, Father General would appoint. The, each each counselor. However, uh, sister, in the, the general counselor, uh, 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 they are, okay, uh, sorry, uh, let me verify. They are, sister, appointed by the general because uh, we, we, we never elect the counselors. Uh, only the general is elected. So, 
So that's it. So uh, because the general would like to uh, to work, uh, to appoint somebody with whom he could work. Yeah, of course he he listens to so many so many advice, no, so many information regarding those that uh, he will appoint. Yeah, and it's in our constitution, so it's not out of the it's not out of the ordinary that we do. It's within the constitutional provisions. Yeah, I'm aware that it's not the same with the others. So, but uh, we are. It's okay. No problem. Yeah, we just have to avoid too much politicking you know, <laughs> in our congregation. I heard. I heard. No, it's, it's very sad. It's a congregation of men. So uh, they had a recent election. This was pre-pandemic, and then uh, they one was elected, but uh, who was not a candidate of this group. So this. One person, Father, many of us, we just want to leave the congregation because we know that uh, we will not be treated well by the new provincial. Maybe they will even assign us in difficult assignments. Imagine uh, that is not communion. Huh? That's not communion. That is not union. And that is not what, we're, what, we were, uh, what we were formed to be by our founder. So again, it has to be avoided. No? Uh, okay. So, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue. Okay, now the Superior General usually holds office temporarily with a term, term of office. No? Uh, okay, just a quick uh, survey. Uh, each one, please tell me uh, what is the term of office of your superior. First, let's start term of office of the provincial or the regional superior or whatever you call the major superior. What's the term of office? Anyone, please, uh, you can start saying how many years for provincial and then general. For us, is one term is three years, but can be re it can is renewable. But how many times can uh, be renewed? Until two, two terms or so six years. Okay, so six years. Uh, what congregation? Sorry, the one Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, for others. Ah, uh, SSPS, others. Missionary okay. Sisters of Our Lady of the Angels, Father. Sa amin po, general superior, six, five years. Five, uh, five years, years. Renew, renewable twice. Why? So, so maximum years, 10 years. Ten years. years. Okay. 10 years, okay? Regional general. superior, uh, that's general superior. Regional superior is only two years. One term, two years, then up to three terms. So three terms po, maximum na yon, that is six years. Six okay. years. Huh? Local superior is the same. Local superiors are the same, three terms. Okay. But the assistant secretary is as long as they can do it. Yun po. Okay. So two years, uh, that's uh, that's quite something new that I know. Usually three years, di ba? But this one, two yeah, years it, makes, po. it makes sense also. Makes so sense that... po. Two years and three terms, it's yeah. enough, Father. Yeah, enough for, the, for the, the superior and the members. I need the change. Also, if the person does not do well, can be changed after two years. Yes, po. Yes, po. After yeah, two there's, years. There's, there's a good deal of wisdom there. And if doing oh, well, oh, then oh, continue. Oh. Yeah, Sister uh, Jennifer. Jennifer. For us, Opiciena, for us, Opiciena, it's uh, six years. The general, uh, the superior general and the counselors. Six can years. be renewed? Can be elected, Father, for another term. But so still can, in our chapter. So it can be 12 years, huh? 12 years. No, but if we want her to be still for another six years, it should be elected us in the general chapter. So the general can be general for 12 years? Yes, yes. Okay. Provincial naman, sister, the provincial. Uh, we, don't, we don't have provincial oh, yet. So it's one, it's one, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Others, uh, how about anyone? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, Sister Chris, uh, MCST. Ang general and provincial, how many years and terms? In our case, Father, uh, six years. Six okay. years. And all, and the counselors also. Can be renewed? No, no. But ah. uh, we can be re-elected, but not uh, consecutive ano po, terms. Ah, okay. So the term has to end, and then yeah. a new person come in and then can be re-elected. Yes, father. Yeah, six years. Sister, uh, father, yes, Suraj. Yeah, for the OMI, for general, 
uh, it's uh, six years, then again six years uh, all together yeah. twelve years, and for the provincial it's uh, three years again three years six years all together. I see. Okay. Yeah. So six. Yeah. Okay. Others. Okay. Uh, Sister Nguyen Toyen, as chairman yeah. census. Yes, Father, for the for our servants, we uh for Mother General six years and can be re-elected for and for Madre Provincial three years can be re re-elected for. Provincial can be renewed another term. Yes. So usually then the standard, no, around six years. Yes, correct. Okay, others, sister uh, FMA, FMA sisters. Sister Sungmin. Yes, Father, for us, the Mother General, uh, for us, six years and extended once. So, total yeah. 12 years. But for uh, provincial, gen uh, provincial Superior, only six years, Father. Six years, okay. Yes. Holy Spirit, Sister, Sister Leoncia. I mentioned already, Father. It's, uh... <laughs> okay, the Holy Spirit. Okay. <laughs> others, others. How about the 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 Franciscan uh, Franciscan friars the Immaculate? Father. Yes. Uh, for us, uh, for the general superior, six years, and then can be reelected for another six years, and All for right. the uh, local, just like the others, three yeah. years, and then can be reelected another three, three. three years. Yes. Okay. So more or less similar and the same. Lalaba, everyone has been uh, okay. Uh, the, the, how about the Carmelite fathers? Again, it's a salita. Hello, father. Uh, for us in the Carmelite father, for the general, we have six years. Uh, every term can be elected to two terms, so that is six years for the general. And for the provincial, we have two terms of three years consecutive. Then, uh, for the third term, that would be depends on the uh, general no? uh, okay. the general will allow and uh, after one uh, term of break the former provincial can be elected ah, okay so my, my, there's a kind of interval yes okay okay so the other sense that's not term they are forever. <laughs> so, but usually for the diocesans, no, in many cases, they have a, especially the parish priests, their term limits. In Indonesia, they also priests, parish priests have term term limits uh, in, in the one, parish. In one term is three years. And actually, normally, uh, the parish priest is two term and uh, six years. Six years. But are there places where there is no rule like that? <laughs> no. uh, so that's good. No? So there, because there was a time uh, some years ago, even in the Philippines, no? uh, in the 1980s, there, were, there was no rule about, uh, it's not even in canon law, uh, that the, the parish priest should remain only within the term. Uh, that's the, the reason why some parish priests, they serve a parish for about 20 years, 25 years. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, let's continue. Huh? Okay, in, in autonomous monasteries, uh, those whose provincial is the superior of the monastery itself. Okay, uh, the election is presided by, uh, by the bishop. Okay. In institutes of diocesan right, election is presided by the bishop. So I know in Vietnam, there are many institutes of diocesan right, no? For example, you know, the lovers of the Holy Cross, uh, their election is presided by the bishop. Because precisely because they belong to diocesan right uh, congregations. Now, our own religious our constitution should establish very clearly the duration of an office, as you all have mentioned. Okay, uh, our constitution should also establish the minimum number of years. After definitive profession, after which someone can hold that office, no. Uh, so, well, uh, yeah, from definitive profession means perpetual profession. No? Yeah, well, probably for most congregations, right after 
perpetual profession, the person can already become a uh, become a religious superior or a provincial, no? or even general. More and more in many other, in a number of congregations that I, I notice, the generals are becoming younger. Young generals uh, are taking over. And more so, uh, young uh, provincials are taking over. Like, for example, our own provincial is, is much younger than me, no? <laughs> Father, Father Savior Olid. Whereas the previous provincial, uh, we were around contemporaries. We were in the same community when we were studying theology. But this guy is uh, much younger. Now for we focus on the provincial superior, Canon 620. Uh, the provincial superior has authority only over a province, no? or whatever group uh, you might want to call it, a district or a vicariate. So that is the major superior in some places called the provincial superior. Okay, now different provincial superiors or different religious uh, regional superiors have equal authority. Okay, uh, what I mean here is this: so the, if you are the the vicariate superior in the Philippines and other countries around Asia, you are equal with your European counterparts. Uh, I have to stress that because sometimes we might feel ah they are they are higher. In, in authority because they are in Europe or in the U.S. because they have more money or whatever. But as canon law states, it's very clear that the different provincial superiors have equal authority. Huh? Now the provincial superior is chosen by canonical election or by appointment. Okay? So therefore, in canon law, take note that... Um, we are not bound by elections. Eh? Your, our religious congregations are not bound by elections, although because then we have gotten used to that no? for many religious congregations. But remember, canon law allows appointment by the general. Okay? So therefore, if a religious congregation is being torn apart by politics in the election of their provincial, the congregation, the superior general, can appeal for a, for a change in their, in their statutes before the Holy See. And the Holy See, since it approves, it is the, the Pope is uh, the one who approves definitively the, the congregation's uh, upper, uh, you know, uh, constitutions and the complementary norms that uh, changes can be done. Because it is within a uh, canonical provision that an the appointment of the, the provincial superior may be elected or appointed. Okay, however, election is obligatory, as I mentioned, for the designation of a supreme moderator or the superior general. Now, regarding local superiors, after we discuss this section on superiors, then we will go on a break. So it is in Canon 6 to 5, paragraph 3. Now, how do you constitute or how do you kind of uh, have other superiors, which we call local superiors? Usually local superiors are superiors of a house or they can be superior in, a, in an area, no? in a province or in a place. No? Uh, according to 6 to 5, paragraph 3, it's by, by election. It uh, requires the confirmation of the major superior. Okay. Uh, sometimes, how do you do this? Uh, if you are very few only in your community, mag election pa ba? <laughs> if you are only five. Volunteers na lang. <laughs> ah, yeah. Why not? But take note that uh, we have to be careful of over-eager volunteers. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I let you know something, huh? Again, I will not identify which congregation. Uh, it's very sad. No? Uh, um, there was this the election. They had an election of the provincial. Nobody wanted to take on the job. So that would lead to a crisis of leadership. No? Uh, yeah, that's very difficult. No? 
the person is elected but uh, does not accept. So, okay, what can we do? Because you cannot force a person to take on an, an ecclesiastical office. It should be freely accepted, no? And then, so what do they do? They have to have another election. And then the, the next person elected, again, did not accept. So nobody wanted to lead. It's better if there are volunteers <laughs> rather than those elected are not, uh, don't want to take on the responsibility. But again, that's a crisis. Huh? That's, that's a real crisis for a particular congregation. So there. Okay, again, uh, local superiors also by appointment, by the major superior. No? Uh, for me, this is a better arrangement. No? The appointment is to be preceded by suitable consultation. Okay? Imagine uh, the division that can happen if you elect. Huh? Yeah. Okay, the duration of office of superiors uh, in Canon 624, paragraph 1. Okay, and superiors are constituted for a certain and appropriate period of time or a term, as you have mentioned, unless the constitutions establish uh, otherwise. So, yeah, for our general... Our general superior uh, is uh, for life, actually. So the, yeah, so for life, like the Pope. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why they call the Jesuit general as the Black Pope. Why? Because the White Pope is elected also for life, no? So the Black Pope is also elected for life. But however, it does not mean that even in, in old age, he has to be general. No, he can resign. You know, in the same way that the Pope can resign, like what Pope Benedict did. No, uh, Elected for life, yeah, but can resign upon discernment of the situation, especially considering the health, the capacity of the general to lead the congregation. So uh, we had uh, uh, Father Pedro Arupe, who was our general in the 1980s. 70s, 80s, so because he was visiting the Philippines at that time, uh, the, the Philippine Jesuits gave him so many activities, so many appointments. So on his flight back to Rome, he got a stroke. <laughs> so when we learn about the stroke, oh, <laughs> yeah, he got a stroke and then he got debilitated and then he, he, he resigned uh, and then we elected a Dutch uh, superior general. Now, uh, yeah, uh, Father Kalbenbach, our Superior General, also resigned after many years. Uh, so that's it. So it's possible to resign. Okay, uh, regarding the personal care and governance by religious superiors. Okay, so basically they perform what, uh, like what as Jesus did, uh, the, the office of Jesus to teach. So the superiors teach in accordance with the charism of the institute. And also, uh, religious superiors also sanctify. Sanctify means to help guide towards holiness, no? sanctification. So it's also the role of superiors to sanctify. That is to build in Christ a fraternal or a sisterly community in which God is loved above all, according to Canon 619. Any religious superior, especially uh, as we see more visibly, governs no? to order, to bring order and peace in the life of the community. Okay? Because uh, without order in the community, we will not be able to fulfill our mission. So it's also the role of the, of the superior to distribute work among the members according to their capacities. So, so it is not good when some members of their community just read the newspaper the whole day and then a few members of the community do all the hard work. <laughs> uh, or, I'm, I'm sorry if I have to stay also, uh, <laughs> remember Martha and Mary? No? <laughs> so Martha was doing all the work, no? just like what many of you do, no? many of us, hard work, hard work. And then uh, Mary, 
So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not kind of because uh, it is, it is a story that we have to merge together. We have to put together our life of prayer and our life of apostolate. No, those two should come together. But you know, but we have to understand some of our members are already old, and they are not, they have are sick, so we cannot expect them really to do hard work. But while we are strong, no. While we can really perform uh, the ministry, then we have to share the burdens or the responsibilities with our other sisters uh, or brothers in our community. So ordering of the life, distributing work among the members of the community, coordinating the apostolic activity of the community. So, you know, a superior has a very important mission no? to do, whether you are in a religious congregation for men or a religious congregation for, for women. So I wonder uh, which is for which is easier to handle kaya. Men who are in our community or the sisters in our community. You know, I will tell you a story, huh? I hope you will not be scandalized, huh? Um okay, this is now a, a, a monastery, huh? Monastery to. These are cloistered nuns, no? Because I heard a priest, uh, uh, yeah, the, the priest is a kind of a, you know, he's a psychologist, no? He was give, asked to give a talk uh, to the um, more cloistered uh, community. So the priest said, well, what, would I, what talk will I give them? They, they should be very holy already. You know, everything is fine there. So what else can I do? So when he got to the community, uh, then... Then he learned <laughs> so many different uh, issues uh, within uh, the community. Like uh, sometimes there are even among holy women, there are ingitan, no? Uh, why is she favored more by the superior? Because I guess because they live in close, no? They notice so many little things, no? <laughs> little defects uh, with each other because they are in close, no? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's a reality of life, no? Anyway, so are there questions that you might have before we take a break? It's now uh, uh, 3.40. No questions? Any sharing about your community? Do you equally share the duties and the responsibilities <laughs> in your house? Or you do all the work? <laughs> How is your oh yes, father? Anyone? Yes. Voila. How is your superior? Are you happy? <laughs> Voila. Oh, you're so quiet. Maybe you're not happy. I'm just joking. Okay, so we I'm are, happy like, with my superior father. Yeah, hey, very good, very good. You know because what? I am the superior. She is the superior. Because I am the superior. <laughs> superior. Because I am the superior. <laughs> well, let's pray. Everybody's happy. You know what? Yeah, uh, here I'm for us here in Loyola House, uh, we are still waiting for our new rector, because our provincial now, he was the rector of Loyola House of Studies our formation house. So, so the, the rector of the formation house is now the provincial. Now, so there's a vacancy, a rector. So our new rector now is not yet here because he is still the novice master. So the novice master, Father Chris Dumadal, uh, was appointed by Father General to be the rector of Loyola House of Study. So at this time, we still have an acting, an acting rector. So... Until April 1. So soon, by April 1, uh, Father Chris Dumada will, will be, uh, arrive as our new rector. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's very young also, much younger than me. <laughs> yeah, because when I was director of the pre the candidacy house, and I was also a vocation promoter, so I lived with him together in the candidacy house. He was still a scholastic at that time. So he was the assistant director of our of our pre novitiate house. So I was joking him, oh, you be kind to me, huh? <laughs> I was kind to you when I was your director. Uh, joke lah. Okay, so let's come back at uh, 4 o'clock.
for uh, we'll have a break uh four o'clock four o five fifteen to twenty minutes break. Okay, see you later in a while. So welcome back. Uh, the Code of Canon Law in Canon 630, paragraph number 5, uh, it provides a very important guideline uh, for the relationship of religious superiors with the members of the community. Uh, so the relationship of the superior with the members of the community uh, should be based on trust and not on suspicion. What does the law say? say? The members are to approach uh, their superiors with trust and be able to open their minds freely and spontaneously to our religious superiors. Superiors, however, are forbidden in any way to induce the members to make a manifestation of conscience to themselves. So let's start just with the first paragraph here. Um, yeah, so it's important uh, if we, we always should have in mind our own uh, union and communion with one another. Remember in our introduction of the, into the course, we stress the fact that the church is a communion, no? Uh, the church is a community of equals um, living together to fulfill a common goal. And that is very definitely true for our own religious congregations. Uh, even if we come from different countries or we come from different places in our own respective countries, even if there will be a lot of differences among us, remember our life as religious should be a life of communion with one another. And uh, it, the, the superior has an important role of bringing together the members of the community in union. Uh, and that relationship, uh, of course, we cannot idealize the relationship in our religious communities. Because as we all know, based on our experience, there are many, a number of problems that arise in our own religious communities. Uh, situations that actually can disturb the peace. Uh, that we experience the community. Uh, first, let's start with the different personalities. There are some members of our communities who are very nice. Most of them, in fact, most probably, most of our companions in the communities are, you know, they're a joy to be with, no? In your own religious communities. However, we have to accept the fact that even in our own religious communities, there's always somebody who... <laughs> There's always somebody who can be very negative, no? Uh, somebody who will never see anything positive <laughs> in our community and in the world. Some members of our communities are rather combative, no? Uh, uh, even if you're just trying to joke, then the person takes it so seriously and gets angry uh, at you. <laughs> Some members of our community are very calm, Palma lang, relax. Some are rather what, uh, obsessive compulsive or uh, everything has to be done well. Something like something like a militaristic, no? Uh, that is a given in our life as religious, but uh, considering our vocation and our mission uh, that we have to fulfill, uh, superiors should try their best to bring us together well. And on the part of the members of the community, Okay, uh, they should be able to express their minds freely and spontaneously to them uh, in a way that will build community and will keep our unity strong. Again, uh, I would say regarding, since many of you are formators, uh, I also noticed this among, uh, among uh, some seminarians uh, when I was in San Jose Seminary at the Austin Seminary and even uh, in a scholasticate where 
the, the seminarians are Jesuits, they have different personalities. Of course, obviously, that's, that, that's, that does not have to be said. Some, uh, some young men and some women among yourselves, some are quite mature. No? Uh, they are rather self-assured, they're confident, uh, and they could relate easily with the superior. No? They can relate easily with the formator. It's kind of normal, like the way mature people relate with one another. But as I noticed, there are some who will try to avoid you seated at table, <laughs> especially in bigger communities, so when the people have the chance to avoid each other. <laughs> in smaller communities, they have no choice. You're, you just sit together in one table. <laughs> but there are some formats like that. If they could avoid sitting with the superior, they will try their best. And alam naman tayo, we are kind of observant. So I, I actually know who are trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, well, because again, uh, young men and young women, they might have different levels of maturity. But we have to be, it's good to be alert, not to be observant. Because these kinds of behavior, they are pointers to deeper problems. Some of them might have authority hung up. Exactly, that's the problem. Authority hung up. They cannot relate with people in authority. Why? Maybe their father, they remember their father. My father was very strict. And when I see the formator, uh, he, he behaves like my father. So I'll avoid him. But the superior, I'm not your father. <laughs> so uh, your father is your father. And uh, you know, this can be... Uh, the, uh, this, by our uh, observant uh, capacity to observe, then, then we can see how we can guide uh, these young men and women in formation. Okay? Uh, our, each one of, uh, I suppose, our own, uh, our formators themselves, especially the superior, the one who's in charge, uh, sits with the foreman for a face-to-face Kind of a, we call it individual colloquium. Kamustahan, in other words. So uh, for us in our community, uh, I think the, the, the superior sees each seminarian uh, around two to three times a semester. Uh, once every two months, for example, I think. No? So they, they try to exchange, how are you? How is your life now in your life of studies? So it's an open conversation. Um, and the purpose is really for the formator to be able to assist and help the person. Some would really easily open themselves up, even their deepest secrets, even those secrets that uh, they have been keeping even before entering religious life. Uh, so there we need to have the capacity to listen and to observe. Yeah, it's good to listen to what has been said or what is being said. But it's also important to listen to what is not being said. <laughs> Sometimes what is not being said is even more important. And in your course, uh, you have a way to kind of to help you in the training of listening, of discernment and spiritual direction. Uh, you have that course with you. And also we have a course on the anthropology of the Christian vocation. Uh, there you will find a means for you to kind of be trained. In the, in, the, in the craft of listening uh, to what is being said and to what is not being said. So there, and some will be open, some will not be, will not be too open. You need to ask questions to guide the person out of himself or herself. Okay, according to the law, uh, superiors are forbidden to induce the members to make a manifestation of conscience. What is this manifestation of conscience? Uh, to open up, to open up, matters uh, of conscience to you, the superior. It's like confession. No? Uh, when we do confession, we, we open up uh, our, the good things that we do, but also more of our faults, our sins. No? Uh, superiors cannot do that. Induce the person to a manifestation of conscience. Uh, you can, we cannot tell our formats, okay, tell me everything about your life. Open up, don't hide anything. 
everything has to be said. What is in your conscience, what is in your mind, what is in your everything has to be said. No, uh, that is what we call a manifestation of conscience. No, uh, no. So what do we do now uh, in individual consultation or individual colloquium? Uh, it has to be. It, it should be a free conversation that is not forced. No, uh, uh, it should not be a something that uh, will kind of uh, violate his or her privacy. So let's kind of. Do you see how? the thin line between them, what do we do now? What can we not do? So uh, what we can do basically is to set up the, an environment wherein the, the four mans, men or women, will freely open themselves, uh, their minds and their hearts to us. Like, a, like a, a, a son or a daughter opening up his or her heart to, to the parent. There. Uh, okay, uh, just to deepen our understanding of the manifestation of conscience, what is it? It is the disclosure of all matters of the interior life, both grace and sinful, the disclosure of one's virtues, intentions, affections, and repugnances. That is practically everything. Huh? Uh, the purpose is so that the superior may know them intimately, spiritually and humanly for the purpose of spiritual and moral guidance in view of the mission and the apostolic. So it, it looks good, Diba. It looks good, no? And it looks very useful. But the thing there is, uh, as religious superiors, we could, we could not take control of everything that is inside the person because the foreman, the seminarian, or the novice sister has also has the right to keep uh, to privacy, basically, no? No, to privacy. Uh, we cannot force anyone to, 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 to open all these matters uh, to the person. If freely, if freely they open it up, then that's fine. But then the law says we cannot induce okay, uh, the person. It is important for us as formators to get to know our formants, but in a way that will respect their privacy and they do it freely at the same time. Okay, so we're talking about the freedom no, of our subjects, the freedom of our formants. Okay, uh, as, uh, I hope everybody understands when I say formants, those who are being formed. No, uh, under our care. Canon 630 states that superiors are to acknowledge the freedom due to the members concerning the sacrament of penance and the direction of conscience. Okay? Again, freedom. For the sacrament of penance, any, uh, our, our four months uh, basically are free uh, to confess to, to anyone who is available. No? Uh, usually, you know, I guess religious congregations or communities would invite priests no? to come to confession uh, during the reconciliation service, for example. Okay. Uh, what we cannot do, even if we made these priests available, is to force our uh, formals to confess. Okay. Uh, they might not be comfortable to confessing to that particular priest, so they should not be forced to do that. They are free to choose to whom to confess. And also the direction of conscience. No, uh, Here we are talking about basically spiritual uh, direction. No, So there uh, for spiritual direction, let me tell you what we cannot do. If you're a priest and you're a formator, you cannot, you cannot ask your subject, the seminary, to confess to you. <laughs> no. We cannot. We should not even hear the confession of our of our seminarians if you are a priest. And the reason there is this, no. Uh, what happens in confession is internal forum. What we learn, what we hear about confession, we cannot use to make decisions for them. Otherwise, we are violating 
the seal of confession. Okay? Uh, uh, okay, come to me. Come to me for confession. Let me hear your sins. Oh, you did that? Okay, I will not, I will not give you the vows. I will not approve you for vows. That is against the sanctity of confession. That is against the seal of confession. Because you are using what you know, what you have heard from confession, to make a decision about that person. And that is the reason why the seminarian should confess to other priests. And also on the other side, if the seminarian confesses to you, maybe the seminarian might just present a nice image of himself. So there is no openness. There is no, uh, because of uh, I'm afraid that uh, my, my rector will, uh, will use whatever I say in confession against me. So the seminary will not be open. So it does not kind of uh, lead to a fruitful confession. So their superiors also are not, as I mentioned, superiors are not to hear the confessions of their subjects unless the members spontaneously request them to do so. If you look at the inclination of this canon, they are not to hear. Now there is a situation unless. But we have to look at the general tone of canon law. Okay? Because canon law in general prohibits it. So therefore, uh, it would be better to, look, uh, to invite a priest from outside when in our seminaries for them to come to confession. Okay? Now, for sisters, obviously, the sisters cannot hear confession. No? Uh, uh, somebody who has to come from outside to hear the confession of the sisters. But for us religious superiors of women, you cannot talk to that confessor about your novice or your junior sister. You cannot talk to the confessor, oh, Father, how is my, how is my sister there? Uh, you think uh, we can give her the vows? No, that's a violation of the, of, the, of the of privacy. If the priest tells the superior or the formator, yes, sister, she's very good. I just heard her confession. Everything's good. That is a violation of the seal of confession. Now, that priest can be excommunicated for violating the seal of confession. Okay. So you see here what is being really safeguarded. First, the integrity of confession. Number two, the privacy uh, of our formats. Uh, and then uh, for, on the part of the formators, uh, there should be other ways for us to evaluate the behavior of our sisters outside of these settings, no? outside of spiritual direction, outside of confession. Something about spiritual direction, not before I call Sister Gina. Spiritual direction is almost like confession. The privacy, the secretness of spiritual direction is almost like confession. It's just that confession is what we call a sacramental internal forum. For spiritual direction, it is non-sacramental internal forum. So the privateness, the secretness that happens in that relationship in that uh, conversation between the spiritual director and the foreman is only between them. I, as spiritual director, cannot go to the, uh, to the formator, to the novice mistress, and tell the novice mistress what I know about this woman in spiritual direction. That is a violation, again, of privacy. Okay? So... <clears throat> So that is uh, important. So what we do in, like in, when I was in San Jose Seminary, so I was spiritual director of some of the seminarians. So at the end of the year, we have to evaluate all the seminarians one by one. So when it's the turn of this, my spiritual directee for evaluation, I, we are asked to go out of the room so that the rest can evaluate the person. So that I may not be able to say anything about my spiritual directee. No? Sometimes rectors can be tempted to take the shortcut. Talk to the spiritual director. He knows a lot. So the temptation is, uh, I'll just ask the spiritual director. 
so that I can make the proper decision regarding this seminar. That's not allowed. No shortcuts. You yourself, as rector, should have the means somehow to evaluate the person by your personal contacts with the seminarians, by your monthly or by monthly conversation with uh, with the uh, seminarians. So personality here is also important. If you the formator should be, you know, somehow we are not perfect, but should have at least the personality wherein the seminarians or the sisters will freely open up to that formator or to that novice master or to that superior. There. Yeah, uh, Sister Gina, you're uh, asking a question. Father, you already answered it. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> About the spiritual yeah. direction. Yes, yes. Uh, for... Uh, you know, I know uh, for the, the congregations for men, huh? because I'm familiar with them, some of the congregations for men in the Philippines are rather new. They just arrived in the 1980s. Uh, they have very few Filipino priests. Pa. And then in their formation house, they have the set, they have the rector, uh, and then one other formator. So, so um so when I taught them Kanolo, I told them this, the rector, the superior, uh, should not hear the confessions of the seminarians. And then one seminarian raises that, how come, Father, in my congregation, my superior hears the con our confessions? Yeah, because uh, yeah, I understand, there are very few. They have no other confessors. But take note, in New Manila, it's like a Vatican city. There are many religious congregations in New Manila. All, he, all the superior has to do is to invite other priests from other congregations to come to the house and to hear confession. So, yeah, I don't know if it's out of ignorance that the superior does not know. So, uh, there. And, of course, surely, the superior and the formator, like the novice mistress or the junior mistress, uh, Surely he or she has a role to play in the formation of the seminarians or the sisters. But normally, normally, the sister has should have another spiritual director or directress. Yeah. Um, in smaller congregations, it might be a challenge, but there are many other religions who are willing to help. So, for example, like the bigger congregations, like in New Manila, RVM. So, for example, there are many other sisters in the place, in the compound, who can serve as spiritual directress of a particular person in formation. So in our situation here in Atene, among our scholastics, our, our rector is never spiritual director of the seminarians. No? The formator, like a, a formator, uh, just assists the superior. No, He's a member of the community, uh, like that. Yeah, he can. He can be spiritual director. Yeah, but not the person in charge, not the superior, cannot be the spiritual directress or director of the four months. Yeah. And the reason is, as superior, you are external forum. As spiritual director, you are internal forum. And these two have, should not be put together. Yeah, it's a challenge no? because, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, there are really certain uh, limits, no? Uh, all this is really basically self, the protection, the protection of our younger men and women in formation. Uh, we do not want to have that, that, we are in a position of power. If you are superior, even as a formator, you're in a position of power. There has to be uh, some kind of a limitation to that power in relation to those who we guide. Uh, there. Yeah. Uh, somebody was raising her hand. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Sister, uh, no. Sister Jennifer, please. Uh, usually, during our work, during our formation years, Father, we also have what we call individual colloquium. So it was already written there that it was already from the youngest to the <laughs> eldest novice or junior yeah. should have an individual colloquium. So is it is it possible that if for example I'm the foreman, can I still say I'm not ready for 
individual colloquium? Can I do that? Ah, uh, okay. So this is a kind of a individual colloquium with the superior, the no? Yeah. With, the, with the superior of the house. Formator. Okay. Formator. Or sometimes superior. Okay. Yes. Yeah. First of all, I'd have to say that, you know, it is really a, a duty and obligation of religious superiors. So, uh, the idea yeah. is to get to know the person whom we guide. No? Mm -hmm. That is the purpose of that individual colloquium. No? So, uh, after it's, them. Okay. It, it, uh, it is a, it's a sisterly act. No? It is a fraternal action. No? That is the spirit of that. It is not to fish. <laughs> it's not to fish information. <laughs> it's not to, to catch somebody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But in some cases, we have to know information. But that's the spirit, no? the spirit behind it. So uh, therefore, on the part of the of the of the subject no, of the foreman, uh, it is an equivalent obligation on her part. No, uh, so that person should be able to have some conversation also with the superior. Now there may be some aspects of her life that she's not she's not ready to open up. No, uh, she should that should be respected. No? And that's the reason why there is a prohibition about uh, inducing the, to manifest the conscience. No? Uh, yeah, so therefore, but still, that foreman should be able to share something about herself because that is also her obligation. The spiritual journey, Father. Spiritual journey, sharing of spiritual journey, sharing of challenges and difficulties. It's just that some uh, formats have different levels of readiness. And different levels of openness also. Now, if we then for the superior, it's her role or is is his role to guide to gradually let the person open up, no, uh, like a flower as it were opening up, blossoming. Uh, uh, and there needs to be some patience there. No, some are not quite fast uh, in opening up and maturing. But we have to be. Observant then, if this person is continually kind of uh, lacks openness, uh, that's that's information for us also. But the thing there is allow freedom. There it is, the freedom due to the members. But the like what I'm uh, like in your example, a sister cannot say, "I'm not ready to talk to you." Ah, <laughs> nipedio. That's not possible, no. Everybody has to see uh, the 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 superior. Thank you, Father. Yeah, I could not imagine that you know for somebody to 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 do that. Pedi may pass muna, pass pass muna, skip skip muna. It can be a short uh, conversation. That's good enough. Yeah, other questions that you might have? Yes, Father Albertus. Uh, so, as we as uh, for matters, we cannot get some reports or information from the spiritual directors. Yeah, so uh, the formator, in a, in a context of a diocesan seminary, okay, meaning the, the rector, no? Yeah. yeah, the rector cannot get information from the spiritual director. What can be asked from the spiritual director, Father, uh, is your spiritual director seeing you regularly? So if the requirement is once a month, uh, is he seeing you once a month? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, he's seeing me uh, on that level only. Because that's an important question to ask. Because if you ask the spiritual director, Father, has this seminarian been seeing you? Oh, he has not come to me for the past six months. <laughs> oh, that's information about the seminarian. Something just, but nothing more than nothing more than that. Nothing interior. Okay, so let's proceed until uh, the completion of this section. No? Uh, regarding still uh, the canonical visit of the superior and the bishop, six hundred twenty-eight. Now, religious superiors are at stated times to visit the houses and the members entrusted to them. So we are talking here about the provincial, no? The provincial should visit the different communities. 
of the province or the district or the vicariate. Uh, and the visit uh, should be, again, a very sisterly visit or a brotherly visit. And it should include personal conversations with the members of the community. In particular, uh, conversations about uh, her mission. How are you doing in your mission? Are you happy in your apostolate that you are now? Is there anything that I can do? Uh, uh, do you need to? Do you feel you need to be transferred? Do you feel you you will become more more helpful in another apostolate? So everything uh, in view of our mission as uh, religious. So now, on the other hand, the diocesan bishop has the right and the duty to visit the following, even in respect of religious discipline. Let's see. Okay, the diocesan bishop has the right. Karapatan niya, whether or not he will do it, it depends on him. Autonomous monasteries. Individual houses of an institute of the diocesan rights situated in his territory, obviously, because it is the diocesan right. So the diocesan right institute is under the authority of the diocesan bishop. Okay, there. Now, it just strikes me you now that in this canon, there is no right and duty to visit religious congregations of pontifical right. Wala. Wala. In terms of duty and right of the diocesan bishop, to be there in your house, to see you, and to talk to you. No. And the reason is because of our nature as institutes of pontifical right. Okay? Why we respect the bishop? Because we are present in the diocese. The bishop cannot, no, uh, cannot uh, interfere in our inter internal religious life by especially... Uh, doing an official visitation. Of course, the Bishop of Cubao can easily, can anytime visit Ateneo, <laughs> just to see, to relax, <laughs> but not to come to our house. I'd like to talk to each one of your members in Loyola House. We are, there's a certain autonomy that we religious congregations enjoy. Okay, so next class, uh, we will discuss uh, organs of collegial governance. We will now move uh, into the discussions on general and provincial chapters. Okay, so here I have a picture here of, uh, this is uh, when our superior general now from Venezuela, Father Arturo Sosa, was elected by the general chapter or what they call the general congregation. So after uh, his election, so there's a prayer that he prays before the before the, the crucifix. So he's our first uh, Latin American uh, uh, general. Okay, so are there questions? If no, if there are no more questions. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, you're supposed to submit soon no? your uh, midterm reflection paper. Okay, anyway, so uh, uh, you can submit the, the papers to me, midterm papers, uh, by email. So I feel best, uh, just, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, it's still later, no? There's still a lot of time, so uh, the deadline is, uh, yeah, submitted by, by that time, by March 25, still early. So just a simple uh, reflection, what are the things that have struck you in terms of our discussion from the beginning up to this point in time on discussion on religious institutes. So we will still have a class. So don't write your papers first because we still have other topics no? uh, to discuss. So the guidelines are in your uh, syllabus on how to prepare your, your reflection paper. So Sister Chris, yes. Uh, Father, good afternoon. Is it, is it accepted, Father, if, if, for example, a novice uh, opened up about her personal life? Well, in fact, she, I am not her directress because I, I'm handling the postulants, Father. So is it okay, Paul? 
Ah, uh, to open up herself up to to, to me. Yes. Uh, I am not her director's father, but uh I told her the much better if she she could open it up to her uh, directress and she told me uh, she is at home to open that particular topic with me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you do you reside in the same house, sister? The, no, father, no, no. It's a different communities. Yes, Apa. But yeah. oh. the same compound. Same compound, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the general principle is this, no? Uh, yeah, uh, our foremans, no? Uh, they're free, no? They're very much free. In fact, uh, yeah, they're they're not discouraged for, from opening themselves up, no? To other sisters, no? Of the congregation. Thank you, um, Yeah, so... Uh, so personally, you know, it's my opinion that uh, it is good that uh, the poor man uh, is open. You know, there is a person to whom the poor man can open herself up, her struggle, especially you belong to the same religious congregation. Uh, but what you did is good also at the same time. So uh, to encourage that uh, poor man to, to really to open up uh, spontaneously to the, to the novice mistress. So, yes, Father. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, but there's no, there's no rule that uh, each each foreman should only talk to the novice mistress. No, uh, in fact, uh, each foreman is encouraged to have a spiritual director or directee uh, with another thank person. You, yes, thank you. Now, uh, of course, uh, I'm talking about in general terms. Now, you might have specific rules, no, uh, in your congregation regarding this matter. So if you have, then uh, probably we can discuss, uh, even privately, you can email me so that I can also express my opinions. No, Because sometimes, okay, uh, it happens, uh, it can happen, that our guidelines and regulations might actually be wrong. <laughs> so it might be uh, not correct. No? Uh, so at least uh, so that I, I, I can share my opinion. But uh, in, there is a general... As long as it's not against, uh, you know, uh, human relationships and it's not against canon law, there's a general uh, kind of uh, uh, flexibility about how to, how to do things. No, uh, it's just that uh, we might have different uh, practices, but even whatever practices we have have to be submitted to scrutiny also. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, as I forgot the. Uh, I was not able to read the comment. Was there a comment earlier? Uh, Sister Jennifer, you wrote something. Okay. Uh, okay. Make a comment with, with Sister Chris. Okay. Because, uh, sometimes it depends upon the formator. Uh, uh, there are times that, yeah, because it happens, it happened to me, Father, that okay. I I welcomed the, because I was the, the, the vocation promoter and the postulant is very open to me, but I said no. But at still, I I welcomed her, and then it happened that the formator made a comment. She said no, some not not necessarily like that. Okay, so we so, are discouraged. We are discouraged to do that. Uh, uh yeah, to, but yeah, yeah, and, yeah. There's a reason for that also, no? Because we want uh, uh of course, again, freely. We want our novices, you know, to to approach the novice mistress, no. Uh, but still, uh, at the same time, no, we cannot really prohibit any one of them to talk with somebody. Otherwise, but yeah. still, if they do come to us, no. For example, if a novice comes to us, comes to he, us here in Ateneo because they are in the Baliches. Sometimes yeah. they have uh, visits here, and if the he approaches somebody to open something up. So I think the good approach is yeah to welcome to welcome that that kind of a desire to open up because in a sense we might be able to help also but still the goal should be okay I uh, you know it's good that you open this up you know to your spiritual director or to your novice mistress so I'm still still leading to the formal uh, to the formal process of uh, formation yeah that's a good point uh, sister Jennifer. Thank you, sister. Thank you.
Okay? So see you next week. We'll pray first uh, to close the class. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.